Hi everybody, my name is Michael Crawford. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the SOAR CRC and your host for this webinar today. So welcome and thank you for your attendance. By way of introduction, I'd first like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we are meeting today, wherever we are in Australia. I'm in Melbourne in Wurundjeri country. And I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Looking at the uh, list of registrations for this meeting, for this webinar, there's some quite familiar faces. There's also uh, a number of new faces or new names here. So just a, a word or two for me about the Soil CRC, the Cooperative Research Centre for High Performance Soils is our full name. Uh, we've got funding for 10 years from the Australian government and from our partners and participants. We're in the fifth year, just commencing the fifth year. But the purpose of that, uh, of our CRC and, and the reason why we're funded is to undertake R&D related to soil, soil management, soil performance, to help give farmers the tools and knowledge they need to improve their soil management, their soil performance, and in turn, improve their productivity and profitability. We've got 40 participants including eight universities, four state government agencies, eight industry groups, and importantly, 20 grower groups or farmer groups from across the country. And that helps to ensure that our research is connecting with end users and is uh, driven and by, by the end users, the, the farmers. We've been running, running a, um, a webinar program and we've got a list of upcoming webinars. So just a, a moment or two of advertisement. Uh, we're about to hear from Amanda shortly, but uh, in two weeks time on the 5th of October, we'll be hearing from Craig Lobsey from the University of Southern Queensland about a soil CRC project that he's leading on new sensors for measuring soil. A month later on the 9th of November, we are hearing from Jason Condon from Charles Sturt University about a soil CRC project that he's leading on addressing complex soil constraints. Both of those you can register for in the same way as you did for this uh, webinar by going to our website, sourcerc.com.au, looking at uh, either a link to the webinars or events, you'll see the details there. Uh, later in October, we've building on the successful panel discussion we had last month on, on soil data, we've got a panel discussion on rewarding soil stewardship. Uh, how does it work? How might it work? Uh, the role of the finance sector, the role of our consumers, and how it might uh, play a role in incentivizing and rewarding farmers for better soil management. It's going to be uh, facilitated by Catherine Allen, who's our leader of program one, investing in high performance soils, and it will bring some speakers together, both focusing on some of our soil CRC research and some other perspectives. So again, you can register for that via our website on the soilcrc.com.au. Today's webinar is being recorded. And as with all our webinars, uh, you're able to access them later at your own convenience on our website and on our YouTube channel. And speaking of our, our socials, I um, encourage you to, to follow us on Twitter, to connect with us on LinkedIn, and to subscribe to us on our YouTube channel uh, so you can stay up to date with, with this work and with other work involving the Soil CRC. A little bit of uh, housekeeping about today's proceedings. I'm, I'm about to uh, introduce Amanda. She'll speak for about 25 to 30 minutes, so we'll have 10 or 15 minutes for questions at the end. Uh, when it comes to asking questions, the way we manage that is for you to type the questions into the Q and A box. And then at the end, I will read them out and, and Amanda will answer them. If we run out of time, if there's so much, uh, so many questions, uh, we'll then <coughs> carry them over and Amanda will be able to respond to you out of the session um, by, by email or by phone. So to today's uh, webinar, focusing on a project that the Soil CRC has invested in, improving the performance of sandy soils. 
Obviously, sandy soils are a major issue um, for many parts of uh, Australia, the, the agricultural regions of Australia, where agriculture is so important. And they bring together their particular constraints and challenges. Farmers have done quite well to, to manage uh, them so far, but there's uh, opportunities to increase the, the productivity and sustainability of, of agriculture on those soils. Amanda's part of a project led by Richard Bell in, from Murdoch University in Western Australia. But Amanda herself is working for Primary Industries in Region South Australia, PERSA. She's a senior soils consultant for PERSA and has worked on agricultural soils since 1997. In the last decade, she has focused on the importance of organic carbon, particularly in broadacre sandy soils, completing a PhD in 2018 on organic carbon storage in sandy soil following clay addition. So she's very well qualified to both be working on this project and speaking to you today. She's been involved in a number of carbon projects, most recently benchmarking soil carbon in South Australian agricultural soils under different soil types and management practices. So without further ado, I'll pass across to Amanda. Thank you, Amanda. Hi, everybody. I'll just uh, get my screens up to share. Okay, can everybody see that? Yeah, that's good. Wonderful. So today we're talking about improving the performance of sandy soils. Uh, we have a, a great project team and it involves a number of people and it's led by Professor Richard Bell from Murdoch University uh, with partners uh, from the Department of Primary Industries where we are, Federation Uni, West Midlands Group and we have support from the Australian Organics Recycling Association. I just want to say a huge thank you to everybody who's involved in this project. So why sandy soils? We know that sandy soils are often known as low productive soils. They have patchy growth. We know now that there are 16 million hectares of sandy soils in southern Australia. And this equates to about 18% of our agricultural soils. Sandy soils are low in clay. And for the project, we've defined this as less than 10% clay in the top 30 centimetres. And this includes textures of sands, loamy sands and clay sands. Oh, the majority of uh, the types that we look at are less than 5% clay. They're renowned for being low in nutrient and water holding capacity. They're prone to water repellents, to wind erosion, to compaction and acidification. They're also known for having low carbon. And this is basically due to this low clay concentration, which means that any added organic matter um, has, no, has limited protection from decomposition from microbes. We often know that sandy soils have multiple limitations. It's not just one thing that affects this. So we need to, uh, to address a number of limitations before we can expect to have better performing soils. So the aim of this project was to, to lift productivity to a higher performing soil. And we, we would be doing this by increasing the reactive surface area. So by introducing um, products such as clays or organic or recalcitrant products that can hold on to nutrients and water and to create a functioning area for microbes um, into our sandy soils. By doing this, we can address this lack of resources in the root zone and improve our productivity. So the project consists of a number of activities and it included a literature review, we wanted to understand the extent and the characteristics of the sands within Southern Australia. Uh, we wanted to learn uh, from existing trials and demo sites from our meta-analysis. Then we wanted to either identify or develop new products that can be used uh, as addition to sandy soil. So these are often clay or organic clay mixes. With these products, we wanted to characterize these materials and test them in pot and field trials. And in the end, we wanted to design a follow-up project incorporating the knowledge that we have gathered from this project. So mapping and grouping of sands was led by Nathan Robinson and, uh, and uh, sorry, went on to the wrong one. The literature review that we started with, with most projects, we start with the literature review, pulling together the information from the international and Australian uh, areas. We were really interested in identifying and understanding the role of sandy soils in agricultural uh, contexts and what these properties make on uh, the value of production. We needed to understand the challenges of our sandy soils and how they can be overcome and what we can do to make this better. There was a review of our global and Australian trial sites demonstration areas 
about the effects of soil amendments. So these were organic amendments or long-term amendments. So these could have been biochar or clay. And what effects these have on productivity and, and carbon in our soils. Then there was a, a review again, that casting the net really broad about looking for novel products that aren't necessarily used commonly uh, in sandy soil addition. And these could include things like from industrial or mining waste, uh, minerals, organic materials that often aren't used, or uh, some of these new polymer watering or nutrient holding super absorbent or micronized polymers. The next part was the mapping and grouping of sands, which was led by Nathan Robinson and Rick Pope from Federation University of Adelaide. These guys did a huge amount of work pulling together all the individual state soils information and they, and they pulled it together into a single layer that identifies sandy soils and its characteristics uh, in Southern Australia. And this layer will now be available on the Visualising Australia, Australasia Soil Portal on the CR, Soil CRC. We now know that there are about 16 million hectares of sandy soils under agricultural productivity in Southern Australia. And this was an increase of 4 million hectares of what our previous estimates were. We know that this accounts for 18% of our agricultural soils and the importance for the states is, is interesting. So in Western Australia, we note that this is just over 50% of their agricultural soils and around about 20% for South Australia and Tasmania. So sandy soils make up a, a fair proportion of our agricultural areas. The other amazing thing that these guys did was created a criteria framework to assist with decision making when you apply a soil amendment or a modification practice. And it's definitely worth looking at, chasing up this report uh, to, to check this information out. And so we're on to the, the meta-analysis uh, uh, for what we'll be talking about mainly in this project today. So our original aim was to assess what happens to productivity and carbon concentration when we add in long-term or organic amendments to sandy soils. And we wanted to understand what happens to the chemical, physical and biological properties of sandy soils when this happens. Then we wanted to delve a bit deeper and understand the driving factors that influence productivity and carbon in there so that we might be able to tweak these or influence these so we can manipulate them to uh, improve this productivity on sands. One thing I have to say is that this meta-analysis wouldn't have been able to be uh, conducted without the prior work conducted by state and federal departments, um, industry and farming system groups, and tools such as the online farm trials, uh, which is funded by the DRDC, which uh, puts, pulls together a lot of information and, and reports that is available. So I just wanted to say a huge thank you to the considerable amount of work that has been done over the last 30 to 40 years in this area. So for our meta-analysis, we were really driven by um, measures. So looking for key variables that uh, measure productivity, carbon, and this reactive surface area. And when we looked at reactive surface area, we really ended up looking at uh, cation exchange capacity. So uh, data that was available across, uh, southern, across Australia was looked at, and the data set was only compiled when we had two of the three key variables. So productivity, carbon or cation exchange capacity had to be included in the data. So they had to be measured. What we wanted to do was to understand the multitude of factors of these driving forces that influence productivity and carbon across this wide range of Southern uh, Australia. So across not just different sites, but regions and states. So to do this, we looked at measures of uh, productivity. So biomass and yield in tons per hectare and carbon concentration in, in percentage. We also wanted to understand at, at what happened at the site specific, so where the, the treatments were looking at a much more site specific. So in these uh, relations, we used a relative measure. And so that, that was the treatment relative to what the control was. So we had relative measures of biomass productivity and carbon. Our original aim was to look at biological and um, physical factors. Unfortunately, when we looked at the data set, the only measure that we had of physical factors was a bulk density measure. And biological one that we had was microbial biomass carbon. That was the only one that was common to a few of the projects. So the data set is dominated by chemical um, analysis within there and management methods that we have. 
And when we talk organic carbon, I am actually talking about Walkley Black Method. It was the one that was consistent across a number of projects. We do have some projects that had measured total or leco carbon, uh, but the results are generally organic carbon and Walkley Black. So with this information, we ended up with having 89 projects spread across Southern Australia, which ended up in 270 records that we have. We have more records and projects, and that's because there were often multiple treatments being assessed at uh, any one site. You can see there that the infographic there shows that the distribution of data shows that the highest amount was in South Australia of information that we had, followed by Western Australia data. And you can see there in the key variables that were assessed in the productivity and carbon that there are numbers. And wherever you see numbers in brackets or numbers uh, in bold there, they indicate the number of records that, uh, that, it uh, that these variables uh, had for that. So within our sites, uh, within our projects, we were interested in the values of these variables or the soil properties in the zero to 10, but also we wanted to look deeper in the profile. So we were able to gather, gather data down to 50 centimetres. And a really interesting uh, and useful measure was a cumulative value of the top 30 centimetres. Of course, having all of these data in different projects, these treatments and sites were unbalanced. So our analysis was primarily through linear regression and looking at a summary of, of these influencing factors. So in the data set, we ended up with 180 parameters, which were assessed against each of those key variables, variables that we had an interest in. And a relationship was assessed. So if there was a significant relationship, we would record the uh, regression coefficient and the regression coefficient or the coefficient of regression explains basically the variability, all of the dots in relation to a straight line between the variable and the parameter that we we're interested in. With all of these uh, the parameters, uh, and we sorted the, the parameters that we had in uh, order of the, the regression factor. And then we analyzed these down to a top 10. So these top 10 factors were considered to be influencing factors and we use these as our, our main key factors and we were able to provide uh, a bit more information for these by grouping data so we could pull out a little bit more information and an understanding of what's driving this. So our data groups uh, consisted of amendments. So those ones in the green there show what we have for our amendments. So we had long-term amendments and you can see here, uh, long-term amendments are definitely dominated by subsoil clay. 121 of the records uh, had that. But we did have a few sites there that had bentonite clay addition. We had some with biochar and we had some that had applied coal dust. In the organic amendment area, we had uh, those that had compost. We had manure and this was often pig or chicken litter that was quite fresh applied. And we had residue and residue was always plant-based. It was often green, brown or uh, hay could be dried. But we did also have grain and we had a winery waste such as grape mark as well included. And we were interested in the longevity of the response. So the years since uh, the amendments were applied it was a category. Other useful groupings that we had was annual rainfall. Uh, we had depth to subsoil. So this is the depth of the sand over a subsoil layer if it was present. We were also interested in the clay concentration of the top 10 centimetres and incorporation depth. So we either had no incorporation, shallow or deep. Now this is a pretty busy slide and we'll spend a bit of time on this. So uh, I'll just step you through it. So what we have basically here is a summary of influencing factors for our key variables. Um, I won't go through all of the detail that we have here, but I will pick out the key messages. So what we can see there is that on the uh, left-hand side there, we have productivity measures and on the right we have our carbon measures. First I want to just concentrate on those coloured boxes. So uh, there the, you can see the light blue there indicates a climatic variable or an environmental variable. The orangey brown colour indicates a soil property. So this is often those ones that are inherent to the soil or where we had a, where a manipulation to the soil had occurred. And the purple there is indicating a, a nutrition effect or a fertility effect often from addition of fertilisers. The thing to note is that for both productivity and carbon, uh, soil properties had a, a large influencing factor. So the soil itself and how uh, what we had do to it uh, influences productivity and carbon. When we look at productivity itself, we can see that there's quite uh, an influence of nutrition. 
So there's a strong uh, nutrition effect, and this was often linked to mineral nitrogen. When we looked at uh, the data, we could see that the mineral nitrogen was often for the relative measures down to zero to 30 centimetres. So it was important to look at the nitrogen the whole way down the profile. We go over to that carbon side there, we see that the nutrition effect didn't have a great influence on our carbon values, but we can see that the importance of climate did. So if we go up to that uh, organic carbon concentration in the top 10 centimetres, we can see that there are a number of variables that uh, climatic variables that are influencing it. So we had total rainfall. Uh, we also had the amount of rainfall uh, that fell in autumn and winter was important. We can see there the next one we have is proportion of total rainfall. We can see that that has a red box. So we can uh, that means that there's an inverse relationship. So in this case, the higher the amount of summer rainfall, the lower the carbon that was occurring in that zero to 10 centimetres. And this is uh, due to moister, warmer conditions where it's probably uh, in activating the biology to uh, increase decomposition in these areas. And the last one, the uh, indication that we have there is an aridity index. So this um, pulls together information on total rainfall and uh, evaporation at the same time. The really interesting thing to note though is we looked at the, the climate has an effect on that zero to 10 centimetres. But when we go down to that cumulative value of that carbon uh, in the zero to 30 centimetres, climatic effects don't, don't have a strong presence here. And what we can see is that it's, it's more related to the soil properties or what might be occurring in the soil itself in that 10 to 30 centimetres. So there is a strong climatic effect occurring in the zero to 10 that does not necessarily occur in that 10 to 30 centimetres. Other really interesting things that, that, that pulled out of is iron. So we had iron, uh, a DTPA extract, as one of our measures, uh, chemical measures that we had. And we found that it was important for both productivity and carbon. It, it was a strong influencing factor behind that. And we saw that it often was in the zero to 20 centimetre depth that this had an importance. Other factors that were uh, important of, uh, of course, we, we know that the, the data set had a lot of subsoil uh, clay additions. So not surprisingly, clay addition itself has a, a focus and a feature in what we have. So it can be uh, about water repellents. It can be about the clay concentration. When we look at the relative biomass value there, we can see that, um, that there's a relationship there to water repellents and adding clay can overcome water repellents. We can also see that there's an importance to that long-term amendment rate or how much clay was actually applied. When we look at the relative carbon uh, just across from that, we see that uh, yes, a long-term amendment rate is also important, but carbon had a relationship to the water holding capacity uh, that would occur in, in these clays. And interestingly for relative carbon, the uh, incorporation depth of the organic amendment and the long-term uh, amendment was important. So shallow versus deeper incorporation was important. Another standout uh, one that we had was the depth of sand over clay or that subsoil uh, depth uh, measure that you can see in yield and for the cumulative organic carbon. And again, it's in a red box, so it's an inverse relationship. So where we have um, deeper amount of sand over clay, we have lower yield and we have lower cumulative carbon in that zero to 30 centimetres. And as I said, our poor measure, uh, our only measure for uh, biology was microbial biomass carbon. And we can see that this linear, these regression, these co correlations was showing that uh, the microbial biomass carbon in that zero to 30 centimetres was driven really by conditions that support microbial activities. So we're looking at things that have a food source. So the organic uh, matter uh, content there is organic carbon and potentially mineralized nitrogen uh, in the zero to 20 centimetres and also moisture. So when we're talking about that, we, we were talking about iron. So this is an example of what uh, one of the regression, regressions might look like. And in this case, we have productivity and, and organic carbon concentration, and we're looking at DTPA iron in the zero to 10 centimetres. And we can see that there is definitely a, an accumulation of values down in that uh, the lower area. So as I said, these are giving us trend indications rather than really strong uh, correlations. But we can see that there are points along that line there that's, that suggest that uh, there could be a, 
a trend towards higher carbon and productivity with higher um, iron concentrations. When we unpicked what was driving these iron concentrations, we saw that as some subsoil clays were naturally high in iron, there was also some compost and some of the charcoals came with a high natural iron. So we know that iron oxides can bind carbon, which can limit decomposition by microbes, which could explain that association, but we're not quite as uh, clear to the link uh, to productivity. But we do know that this uh, suggests that there is a potential to uh, increase reactive surface area of sands by using products that are either naturally high or with artificial additions of iron. Now we're going to move on to the climate story that uh, came out of the correlations. So when we looked at productivity, we saw that rainfall explained very little of that variation in yield. We do see though that there is an indication of yield improvement uh, where the rainfall is above 550 millimetres. Uh, when we look at the relative measures, there isn't a great deal there, but we do see that there is large variability in relative biomass, which occurs at the lowest rainfall group. And, and this would be a reflection of the rainfall and the, uh, the surety of rainfall in that area. When we look at this relationship between uh, rainfall and organic carbon concentration, it's uh, really quite reassuring to see that there's nothing new here, but it does confirm what we're, we already know. So we see an increase in organic carbon with an increase in rainfall. There is probably more of a relationship in the zero to 30, so that cumulative value um, than the zero to 10. But it is interesting to note that as you get to some of these lower rainfall groups, so below 400 millimetres of rainfall, you see that that distance between uh, the carbon in that zero to 30 centimetres, the cumulative area, and the zero to 10 gets closer together. And what this is indicating is that the majority of the carbon is sitting in that zero to 10 centimetre label, uh, that zero to 10 centimetre depth. And we know from before that this is the depth that is susceptible to those climatic and environmental conditions. Um, so the, the, the higher rainfall groups might have more stable carbon in them just because they are deeper in the profile. The other graph there that we can see is a, a, the carbon against the aridity index. And the aridity index uh, pulls together the, the rainfall uh, divided by the evaporation. And it is also pulls in a temperature factor here. So it's just showing that there is a nice uh, increase in carbon when we get to less arid conditions. Another one that we saw that was a really useful one was this uh, subsoil depth or the depth of sand over a subsoil clay layer. So what we can see is a, a general trend to a decreasing, um, decreasing productivity with uh, increasing depth of sand. When we uh, look at there, we can see there's a notable decrease at uh, 90 centimetres. When we pulled this apart, looking at the organic materials, looking at the amendments that are applied, we have the, the nil there in the black closed circle. We have the clay that had been applied as an amendment in the open circle, and we have organic matter in that gray circle. And what we can see that is at 90 centimetres, if you added clay, the productivity increase did not, was not any better than what the, the unamended sand was. However, if you added an organic amendment here, we could see that we could uh, maintain productivity at a depth at where you would have shallower clay in the profile. If we go on to looking at the carbon concentration, so a similar the depth of sand, we can see a similar trend towards a, a decreasing carbon concentration with increasing depth of sand. And this is really clear for that uh, cumulative zero to 30 centimeter uh, carbon concentration there. But the trend isn't evident in that uh, surface 10 to, uh, zero to 10 centimeters. And again, this, this reiterates that effect of climatic factors in that uh, surface 10 centimeters. When we pull apart that data a little bit more and we look at the amendments that we, uh, we had information for, we can see that the nil again is in the black dots and the clay is in the, the open dots. We can see that uh, at that greater than 90 centimetre depth here, that adding clay actually uh, maintained the carbon concentration. And this would be linked to uh, protection of decomposition and or capturing, being able to protect it from decomposition by microbes. When we're looking at um, the clay concentration, so the subsoil data set was really important. So we were trying to get messages out for clay concentration in the top 10 centimetres. 
when we have the productivity, we look and generally see that they, you can get an increase in relative productivity. So we've got biomass and yield on these graphs uh, up to about 15% before we see a yield penalty observed uh, greater than 15%. So generally there's a slight increase in uh, productivity until we, we can have a penalty. When we look at carbon concentration, um, the story is a little bit different. So we can see that there is often little change in carbon concentration. So the left graph there is showing the zero to 10 centimetres and the right is showing that cumulative zero to 30 centimetres. So similar, uh, similar trends, you can just see it better in that zero to 30. You can get a slight increase in uh, carbon concentration above 10% and you can definitely see that spiking at to those higher rates between that 15 to 20%. So when we're thinking about uh, when we're applying subsoil clays to these sands we'll, and we're considering a productivity and a carbon benefit, you'd probably look to aim for a clay concentration between 6 and 15%. But you would really need to fine tune this depending on what your rainfall is, uh, your clay cop, uh, properties, your subsoil depth and the incorporation method that you're going to, to use. There is so much interesting stuff. I could talk all day about this, but uh, I will just I will just touch on these subjects rather than uh, going through them in detail. So our aim was to improve the reactive surface area and we use cation exchange capacity as our measure. So when we had the whole data set, we were really happy to see that uh, to improve uh, cation exchange capacity, the main driving factors were the clay concentration and the organic carbon concentration. So we can improve the reactive surface area by adding uh, these parameters that can hold on to nutrients and um, uh, can, can hold on to our nutrients. If we just looked at the organic amended subset by itself, so this is removing anything that had any clay added to it, we see that there is a strong reliance on organic carbon as driving that uh, factor, important factor in cation exchange capacity. The longevity of this effect is of course important. We wanna know how long this will take. So for productivity, we often could see changes that were measured in a very short time. And this often occurred in the first one or two years and it stabilized by five years. So the effect had stabilized. When we looked at that organic uh, subset again by itself without any clay addition, uh, the productivity was maintained for slightly shorter space of time, about four years. But then it declined and it often declined back to what a nil result would have been. When there was clay added into those, uh, to the, the mix, the, the productivity often didn't go back to a nil result. It would, it would tend to just rev a little bit higher and, and work a little bit longer there. When we looked at carbon, it was, it was really amazing to see how long the time period was before we could measure some um, relative changes in carbon. And this time period was often five to 10 years. Uh, and that was, had been shown to remain for over 15 years. And a lot of that work, so this longevity period, we have to thank David Hall and Stephen Davies in Western Australia uh, for having these long-term trials that look at this. So the key measure for this is that in sandy soils where we are adding it, we really need to have long-term monitoring trials to make sure that we're capturing the whole picture. Now we've been talking about productivity and carbon as, as separate areas. So it's, it was interesting to look at uh, the relationship between the two. So when we have uh, an unamended, so the data, the, the sandy soil that had no tillage or any amendments added to it, we found that productivity was driven by carbon concentration. And this was often in the 20 to 50 centimetre depth. It, it didn't uh, reflect anything in that surface area, in the surface depth. We found that carbon was largely driven by biomass. And, and this is what you would expect rather than yield. When we look at this whole data set, which has the addition of subsoil clay as well, we can see that there is a weak relationship for improved yield but generally only when carbon in the top 10 centimetres was between 0.75 to 1.5%. This kind of uh, agreed with the international literature, which finds that there is an initial linear relationship uh, with sandy soils and productivity up to about a carbon value of 2%, and that stabilises thereafter. But it was interesting to see at this, uh, these rates, these groupings of carbon. So this came along to be important when we were looking at this nutrition effect. So in mineral nitrogen, we saw before that there was such a strong relationship for productivity uh, driven by mineral nitrogen, but it wasn't as clear for carbon. 
when we looked at these in carbon groups, we can see there that uh, the, anything below 1.5% carbon, that there are a flat line, there is no relationship in, in the data set there. But there is this, this trend or this slight indication that once you get above 1.5% carbon, that the addition of mineral nitrogen may increase uh, carbon in these situations. And it was interesting to see that there was a similar response noted when, uh, when we looked at coal, phosphorus and sulfur as the fertilizer as well. And this could correlate with Clive Kirkby's information about having sufficient nutrition uh, available to increase carbon. So again, we looked at our yield and carbon, that relationship between these two, and we broke it down by amendment. And so we have a couple of different uh, things here. We have in the blue line there, we have the nil, uh, so the unamended sandy soils. So we can see that there is a relationship between carbon and, and yield. Interestingly enough, when you add clay, you can see that brown line that is mirroring the, the nil line there. The relationship doesn't, hasn't improved. So it is, uh, the relationship is still positive, uh, but it hasn't uh, stepped up at all. If you add organic matter to your sand without clay, that orange line there, we can see a flat line. So we can see at, those, uh, at some of those values there, we have an increase and sometimes a doubling in yield. But we don't see a relationship with an increasing uh, carbon there. And that can be because we're adding an organic uh, material to there that is not protected from decomposition by microbes. So we can get a productivity benefit, but not a carbon benefit. When we have add clay and organic matter together, we can see in that green line that you do get a, a response in both yield and carbon. So that they're, they're adding that protection measure can improve our productivity, but it can also improve our carbon. So this had implications for products that we tested in the POTS and field trials. So our POT trials were run at, um, at Neuriupta uh, in South Australia. Originally, it was meant to be done as a microplot trial in the field, but COVID uh, uh, messed us up a little bit. So we ended up constructing these 15 kilogram uh, pots. We had 186 pots running, and we were looking at a number of different products uh, that we had identified uh, where we uh, had products and combinations of products where we had incorporation depth and where we had different fertilizers. So we had matched and, and pharma product. We also wanted to look at a rate trial. So we were looking at different terms um, to make sure four to five different rates to make sure that we hit the right amount in the product trial. As we set these up in October, we uh, grew them with ryegrass under irrigation over summer. So we grew them out for six months and we looked at products such as uh, subsoil clay, bentonite, compost, so plant, manure, and a cultured, uh, a, hum a highly humified uh, product with some clay in it, which was from peat soils. We had loosened pellets, we had biochar, and then from the literature review, we added in uh, some products that were identified from the international literature. So we had zeolite and a rescate, which is a micronized polymer. We have, uh, we grew them out for six months and then we sprayed them out and we've planted scope barley. So Bonnie Armour is our person who is running these at the moment. Simon Neep uh, from Murdoch University has been incredibly busy too, doing very similar, constructing these uh, pots over uh, in glasshouse conditions. So his first experiment, he looked at a, a range of products and incorporation depths that had 63 pots and again grew them over summer. So we had ryegrass under irrigation. And they looked at a product that, that's available in Western Australia. I think it's mining uh, from hydrotalcite and also had bentonite, biochar, compost pellets and a compost, a blended compost clay uh, pellet that's available from Seawise. Uh, the second experiment Simon just established uh, last week, so looking at new products and blends, uh, learning from what we've uh, pulled together. So I had the similar products, but added in zeolite and iron man gypsum to test this theory about iron. He's also included um, hydrogel and spongelite as water holding capacity areas. And uh, just uh, Nathan Craig from the West Midlands Group and WA and Simon have been incredibly busy setting up this field trial, looking at uh, products, a number of products by incorporation and uh, fertilizers, the standard farmer practice, and again, match fertilizers. And uh, incorporating again, zeolite, that Iron Man gypsum, local clay, and these compost and compost clay mixes. So that was a lot of information in a very short space of time. I'm very happy to take any questions or if you want to contact me by email, um, feel free to do so.
Yeah, wonderful, Amanda. Thank you very much. That uh, quite comprehensive presentation, and it shows that the value of the meta-analysis approach. And there's a lot of research that has been done that you can bring it together and get all these uh, wonderful new insights. We have um, a small amount of time for some questions. We've got some questions there in the Q and A box. If there's a question there already that you want to ask, you can um, upvote it, and it'll come to the top of the list. So, Amanda, Rob, Rob Norton's asked, was the iron effect confounded with pH? Good question, Rob. Um, a lot of the, uh, I'll have to have a look at that. It, uh, there wasn't a, a great deal of products that, that had that. Was it confounded with pH? Often it could be at higher pH soils. Some of them were in ironstone soils, so they had a pH in there. But I will have to take that on advisement and have a look at that, Rob, and I'll get back to you on, on those data, if you like. Uh, Aravind Serpanini is also interested in iron. Is, is there any scientific explanation on the positive effect of iron on yield and organic carbon? Uh, so in, in other areas that we've seen, um, iron, the iron oxides binds onto to carbon, organic carbon. We often see in South Australian soils, our ironstone soils have generally higher carbon values than, than you would expect uh, from similar soils. So it's a protection um, mechanism. On yield and productivity, I'm not as clear about why that is why that's occurring. Okay, thank you. Daniel Guinto has asked, or well, two questions, he'll ask the first one first. When you talked about yield, was that yield the yield of different crops or the same crop? That's a really good question. We had a couple of different yield measures. So we we looked at yield as a uh, of the year and they were of all different crops. So we had canola, we had peas, we had wheat, we had everything in the in the mix. Um, we had an average yield that would go across, but in the end we used a lot of measures of relative uh, yield so that it was compared to the control. So it was a, a standard about what we could compare them against. And we, okay. when we did look at yield over time, we tried to pick a, a cereal crop or something like that to, to compare those. Okay, thank you. If anyone else has a question, type it in quickly because I'm going to wrap this up shortly. But the second question now, I'm going to combine it for the next one. Uh, what type of clay was added on these sandy soils? And what about the cost of clay? Is that budget friendly? If yes, okay, then, yeah. that's a really good question. So the clay that was added on these sandy soils, the majority of the trials that are, are there is what the subsoil clay is um, within the paddock. So ours are a kaolinitic clay, in particular same with uh, Western Australia too. So low reaction, low cation exchange capacity clay, uh, but they've been really good for overcoming water repellents. Uh, the cost of the clay, it, um, it depends on the incorporation, but it can be anything from 150 up to $300, $450 uh, per hectare uh, when we're looking at different machinery and different methods and different depths of incorporation. So it's not the clay that costs the money because that's there on site. It's yes. The, it's a process. It's the act of bringing it up and incorporating it. Which yes. Costs money. And there's uh, definitely a, a big story about that too. Yeah. Okay, Amanda, that um, brings us to the end of those questions that we have in my Q&A box. I, I can't see anything else coming up. So that brings us perfectly to, to time. So, so thank you again, everyone, for your participation. Thank you very much to Amanda and the project team that she represents for the, uh, the presentation today. Quite informative. You can, still, you can see there's still a bit of uh, work to happen in this project. And, and, um, further research to be delivered. So we look forward to those results um, over the coming years and there'll be um, more webinars on this topic, uh, on this project uh, in the future. So watch out for it. Okay, just to, uh, again, thank everyone for your time. Remind you to be able to register for future um, webinars and panel discussions through our website. Follow us on Twitter, connect with us on LinkedIn and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you very much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.